Hey everybody, Nicholas Ward here. Thanks for stopping by my YouTube channel. As always, I'd like to say that I really appreciate you doing so and showing me support here. The best way that you can support this channel is to subscribe to it and like the content. Doing so will help me to continue to dedicate more and more energy to producing these videos. As you can see on your screen here, today we'll be talking about Disney. However, before I get into uh, my stock analysis, I do need to go to, through my normal disclaimer saying that I am not offering financial advice in this video or on this channel. I'm not a financial advisor. I'm an investment analyst for Wide Moat Research. I work for the Dividend Kings. I work for iREIT. I edit the Intelligent Dividend Investor newsletter and I manage the portfolio for the Intelligent Dividend Investor, but I do not give uh, financial advice nor do I manage client money. So with that said, let's move away from this uh, Disney Plus screen here and onto the fast graphs for this company as we, because I do want to uh, cover a recent trade that I made in my personal portfolio. As many of you guys know uh, who have followed along in my, with my portfolio over the years, I don't trade stocks very often. Uh, I don't sell stocks very often. Let me, uh, I should correct myself here. Uh, but I did sell Disney this week. Uh, this was a hard decision for me. Disney has been a stock that I've owned for years. Uh, it's a company that I have a soft spot for. I'm obviously uh, very nostalgic. I grew up in the sort of 90s golden age of their animation uh, renaissance. And, you know, every time I hear that little Disney tune at the beginning of the videos, uh, you know, I get that wonderful nostalgic feeling. However, as investors, it's important to know that uh, we should not be falling in love with our stocks. We should always be paying attention to the fundamentals and uh, basing our decisions off of those, uh, you know, with prudent and rational reasoning instead of, uh, you know, a rational sentiment. So with that being said, when Disney uh, gave what I considered to be a disappointing earnings report and the company's stock rallied uh, double digits, I decided to take advantage uh, of what I viewed as an irrational move in the market to take some profits and uh, lower my position weighting and therefore reduce uh, my overall risk. Part of the reason I did this was not just based upon the valuation, but also based upon the fact that in late 2019, Disney announced that they were freezing their dividend. As you can see here, the company had been, uh, ever since the Great Recession, they've been growing their dividend nicely every year. This is why I accumulated Disney stock, because I believed that this dividend growth uh, you know, had the potential to continue over the long term. Uh, however, after the company made the very large Fox acquisition in recent years, the uh, debt on the balance sheet did balloon and management uh, you know, thought that it was important to sort of freeze the dividend due to the debt situation as well as the fact that they had to invest heavily into the Disney Plus service as they wanted to expand it globally. Uh, so a frozen dividend is not necessarily a sell signal in my portfolio, but it definitely puts a company on sell watch. And then... When uh, COVID-19 arrived and you know the vast majority of Disney's operations were shut down, the company announced that it was going to not pay its first half dividend. Uh, I guess I'll quickly note that D Disney does pay semi-annually. They don't pay quarterly, so they pay two dividends a year. And as you can see here, without the first half payment, we're only expecting uh, you know roughly 88 cents, 90 cents a share here, which is half as much as uh, we received last year. So when that dividend cut uh, was announced... I did, uh, you know, put Disney on the chopping block. However, I, uh, as as you guys know, I don't like selling stocks into weakness, I, especially when we're talking about blue chips, and I hate locking in losses. And as you can see here, when COVID arrived in February and March, Disney uh, shares plummeted. Uh, you know, this is showing the bottom here at the end of March at 96, but Disney made a 52-week low in in the high 70s during that sell-off. Uh, my cost basis is uh, in the $94 area, so I was not interested in, uh, you know, trimming my shares at a loss. But as you can see here, in recent months, Disney has bounced back strongly um, up to the $130 mark. And uh, with that being said, I sold uh, roughly 17% of my position. I cut my weighting down from 6% of my portfolio to 5% of my portfolio at... Uh, 129.81. That was my sale priced uh, yesterday. And uh, when I made that sale, I locked in 21.75% profits on those shares. So I was able to lock in uh, nice double digit gains. So uh, I was happy to do so. 
I plan on putting those proceeds to use into another stock that uh, not only pays a dividend, obviously, but it, one with a much higher yield than Disney and one uh, with much stronger dividend growth prospects and hopes of sort of making up for the lost first half payment that I did not receive. Um, but, uh, you know, so that there's sort of what happened recently for me. And now I want to discuss why from a valuation standpoint, as I said, we should always be using valuation to uh, dictate our decisions as uh, value investors and as dividend growth investors. As you can see here, Disney's long-term, uh, you know, normal PD ratio is, you know, roughly 19 and a half times. And as you can see here, uh, due to the fact that Disney's share price has sort of, uh, you know, stayed high where during a period of time where we've seen massive fundamental deterioration, uh, the blended PDE ratio is 60.8 times. So roughly, uh, you know, three times the long-term average. As you can see here, Disney's EPS shrunk by 19% in 2019 and then is expected to fall by another 74% this year. Uh, you know, that's massive. Uh, you know, the 74% is, is just strictly due to COVID. Uh, you know, I can't even really blame management for this. The reason that Disney got to be such a, a large position in my portfolio was the fact that I liked the diversified revenue stream that it had. Disney obviously offers the parks and resorts, which they're famous for. They offer uh, theatrical movies, which have done extraordinarily well in recent years. They have their TV, their media and television assets, uh, sort of with the crown jewel being ESPN, and they have their uh, you know their merchandise sales and things like that. So it's it definitely it's not a one trick pony, and uh, I never really expected a situation where all of their sort of cash flow nozzles were turned off at once. But COVID uh, did basically manage to do that. Uh, sort of the OTC, the Disney Plus, is the only. Uh, you know, really strong service that Disney offered during the third quarter. It was a blowout quarter. The reason that the stock rallied uh, more than 10% is because of the Disney Plus news. Uh, management said that Disney has over uh, roughly 60.5 million paying subscribers at the end of the quarter. Uh, you know, that puts them roughly four years ahead of schedule. Um, you know, when they had initially launched uh, the service, they said that they had hoped to get to, you know, the 50 million subscriber mark, I think, in 2023. Um, and here they are there today. Uh, overall, when you look at Hulu, Disney Plus, and ESPN Plus, Disney's paying subscriber base is over 100 million. Uh, analysts love to see that. They love that recurring revenue model. I've discussed that in other videos uh, with regard to Apple and other companies. Um, you know, those reoccurring revenues do generate a very predictable uh, cash flow um, stream with uh, usually pretty high margins as well. And, uh, and that is the case, um, it's likely to be the case for Disney Plus once the initial investment period ends. Right now, uh, the, the service is not making a ton of money. Uh, the average revenue per user is roughly uh, $5. So it's, uh, you know, even with 60.5 million uh, subscribers there, that's not a huge, huge uh, driver for Disney, but it is a huge driver of growth potential, uh, which is why, uh, you know, we're seeing the stock rally. However, my issue with this is 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 not the current PDE. I can you know definitely justify the fact that uh, you know COVID is an isolated incident, and Disney will bounce back, as you can see here. Uh, analysts are calling for a 75% um, you know growth next year, and then another 89% growth on top of that in 2022. So they are definitely expecting the earnings to quickly bounce back, but. As you can see, even with the 75 and then uh, you know roughly 90% EPS growth expectations uh, during 2021 and 2022, Disney's bottom line will only be back to the level. It won't even be back to 2015 levels. Um, you know they they were generating at the end of 2017 more, uh, 2018 excuse me, more than seven dollars a share. So that's going to require you know many many years here of strong double digit growth. I just, uh, you know, I'm publishing my article about this sale uh, to Dividend King subscribers today. And in that piece, I noted that, uh, you know, a lot of the reason that I sold my shares is because it appears that the market at, you know, this $130, $131 level, um, you know, it appears that it's pricing in, you know, anywhere from, from you know, three to five years worth of growth into the stock right now. And, uh, you know, because of that, we're seeing uh, forward sort of, you know, prudent return estimates that don't look uh, very attractive. That's where we'll head next here on the 
fast graphs, as you can see here, this you know this 60 line, this, this is not relevant. I don't expect Disney to trade at this level for very long. You know, Amazon trades at 60 times earnings. You know, Disney uh, you know certainly doesn't deserve to trade with that type of premium. As I said here, the long-term average is roughly in you know the, the uh, 19 and a half times range. Personally, I think fair value um, is likely in like the 18 times range. That's kind of that would still be a, a large premium to the other media companies, uh, companies like Viacom and Comcast, uh, Discovery, you know, things like that. They do trade for much cheaper multiples. So Disney has historically, you know, been awarded a premium because it's, uh, you know, it's it's viewed as the king of content and it has that well diversified revenue stream. So you know that that's where I arrive at fair value. I you know personally I, I like the 18 times range, but you know I, you could even go up to the 19 and a half, 20 times range if that's where you felt comfortable. So, but with that said, I wanted to note you know even looking a couple years out, if Disney uh, were to trade at the end of 2021 at that 19 and a half times range, which is the long term average, uh, you know you'd be looking at a share price of of only 51 dollars. You'd uh, even you know, so we're talking total uh, annualized rate of return of negative roughly 55% from here. Uh, do I expect the share price to drop to $50 a share? No, I don't. I think the company is strong enough to sort of maintain a position, uh, you know, in the sort of, you know, 80 to 120 range where we've seen it trade for, you know, many years now. You know, I don't think uh, the market will let it get much cheaper than, you know, that $80 range where we saw it make lows. During the you know the the trough of the COVID sell-off in March, because at that point, um, you know we saw strong support develop. That's where support has been for years now. And uh, with that, so you know I'm not sitting here calling for a fifty dollars share price. I'm not you know I'm not sitting here calling even for a uh, ninety seven dollars share price. I, I do think that actually you know what actually I take that back. That 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 is more reasonable. I expected that to be. Lower, but as we can see here with 90% earnings growth, you're going to get higher expectations. But you know, to my point about Disney sort of pricing in, you know, three to four years worth of earnings growth, we're at $130 a share today. If Disney were to trade at its long-term average of 19 and a half times by the, uh, you know, in September of 2022, it would only be $97 a share. That represents, you know, roughly 12% uh, percent negative annualized total return over the next. Um, you know, roughly, you know, you know, a little more than two years here. So that's not what, you know, I don't want to be buying a stock that's expected to generate, you know, such strong negative returns. I'm obviously looking for positive returns. Um, you know, you fast graph doesn't go out to 2023, 2024, 2025. There's not that many analysts uh, offering estimates that far out into the future, but essentially, you know, that's where you're going to have to be to get back to that seven to eight dollars uh, worth of earnings power. And, you know, there's simply too much speculation involved in making uh, estimates that are that far out. There's, you know, as we can see with COVID and, you know, all sorts of things, M&A, uh, disruption, there's political, uh, you know, headwinds as always, there's local regulation, you know, you never know what's going to happen. And so the point is, is that, you know, I'm not uh, comfortable, you know, saying what Disney's earnings are going to look like in 2025. And therefore, I'm not, uh, you know, willing to, you know, you know, buy the stock because of that. Um, the reason that I did not sell all of my shares is because I do generally uh, think that investors are best off accumulating shares of blue chips like Disney. Um, you know, I, I like I said, I trimmed roughly 17% of my position just to lower my risk here. I'd be happy to either buy Disney back at a lower price or, you know, more likely something that will sort of contribute to my passive income stream. Uh, if Disney continues to rally back towards its prior highs and sort of like the 140, 150 range here, I will likely sell, you know, another uh, small portion of my per, of my uh, position. I think Disney, you know, I don't plan on ever going underweight. This is a company that I'm happy to hold for the long term. But, you know, I do think that prudent risk management is uh, is always something that investors should pay attention to when we do start to see some, uh, you know, some crazy valuations like this. So, um you know, that's, that's basically the gist of this video. It's just that, you know, honestly, when, you know, I use fast graphs on most of my videos and when it comes to fast graphs, it doesn't really get, uh, you know, any more ugly than this. Um, you know, Disney is just incredibly, incredibly overvalued. Apparently, you know, looking at this graph, looking at its long-term history, looking at its recent history and, uh, you know, even looking with a massive bounce back on the bottom line in the coming years, 
um, you know, the, the fundamentals will still not support the current share price uh, anytime soon. So that is my sort of thesis here. So um, like I said, over the long term, I still like the company. In the short term, I have my valuation concerns. And, uh, you know, I do not like the fact that the Disney uh, has cut its dividend. So um, that is the video for today. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. I'll be back tomorrow with uh, something else, hopefully something a little bit more pleasant. I know it's not fun to uh, you know talk about bearish theses uh, here, but that is something that we have to do from time to time. So I thank you for your time. I wish you happiness and safety. And until next time, uh, have a great day. Thanks.